Hi and welcome back to another video of JPlay. I am Marcus and today I will walk you through some rounds of Legends of Andor, Chada and Thorn. And yes, the title says it all. In this game, players take over the role of Chada and you guessed right, Thorn. In this two-player game by the designer Gerhard Hecht, who is also responsible for Kashka, which has some slight similarity to this one here. The main similarity is that each player can only activate a card that is in front of each of his or her three rows of cards. This also means that new cards go to the back of each row and so I have to work through all the cards in front before I'm able to leverage the handy dandy arrows or this nice little fellow I met along the road. Needless to say that Under remains a cooperative system and the new designer also kept faith to the Legends system. So Charter and Thorn comes with four Legends and basically also an additional mini Legend that is printed in the rulebook and yeah, gets you accustomed with some of the basic mechanics of the game. Each of the scenarios come with 6 to 10 of those scenario cards, including a nice introduction text right now, only in German unfortunately. Then there is also an extra card explaining you some of the new symbols that will or might appear in this legend. And Ender stays true to itself by keeping the time to learn the game to a minimum. So you only need to digest around 3 to 4 small pages to start with the introductory legend and you learn the rest by just playing from legend to legend. But the main components are those chapter map cards, where you always know where you start, but you also know your destination, so both of those are face up from the very start. Only the two map cards between start and finish will be played face down, so you have to explore those accordingly, of course. In the very first legend there are only two middle parts, so they can only defer if they are played left or right. The later scenarios provide more than just two middle maps, but still you only play with two middle map cards, so it basically increases replayability. Each stage of a legend shows you how many four cards it hosts, and in this starting map it's I believe three, yeah, three of those, and you get to draw those because of different triggers throughout the game. So there are some character abilities which ask you to draw a card, or sometimes you just have to draw some cards because of other four cards. One important thing to mention is, if you ever run out of four cards and some effect causes you to draw another one, you immediately lose the game. But fear not, as soon as you explore the next stage, you are allowed to build a new pile of four cards. And as soon as all heroes are present on the new map, you are even allowed to put remaining cards from the previous map on top of the new stack. Of course, there are plenty of other ways to lose the game. For once, when the curse is landing, on a space with one of the heroes, or if it would ever overtake us, the game immediately ends as well. So especially during the start of the game, I cannot afford to move the curse at all, because this would mean we are basically toast. I will also lose the game if any hero is not able to activate one of his front row cards. And this is a particularly important rule in Charter and Thorn, as I have to activate a card in one way or the other. So, if I cannot activate one of my cards because I would have to pay some willpower or so I don't have at that point in time, it's basically game over. Chada and Thorn is designed for two players, but there is also a set of cards which you can download from the Under website and this allows you to play this game even solitaire, but then you have to play it as Stinner. As the game is currently only available in German and because I don't want to spoil the story for you, I will only show you the core mechanics of Chada and Thorn by just playing a couple of rounds. So definitely don't expect a full playthrough here. At their heart, all legends have the same goal, and that is to reach the respective destination spaces. So basically there is a space for Chada, and there is also one for Thorn. Ideally, you keep both heroes nearby, because if one arrives his her destination and the other doesn't within the next three rounds, and you count those rounds with those nice little campfire tokens, yeah you also lose the game. So, a lot of ways to lose, but exactly one way to win it. Kind of unfair, but yeah, that's the hard reality of Andor. For the first legend, it's recommended to start with Chada, and also that she takes Granolin, the bard, as her companion. So she's allowed to put him right into her middle row of cards. 
All players start with a so-called curse card in each of their rows, so those have to be encountered as well sooner or later. And this is kind of a cool twist in this game, as you will find both helpful and not so helpful cards in your decks. This is especially true for enemies you meet along the way, as those will also be dealt at the back of one of your card rows and have to be activated as well, in order to free up a card you desperately need at that point in time that might wait behind a powerful enemy. In the first legend, each hero starts with two willpower points and you can spend those for certain effects throughout the game. If you are ever running out of those, you don't die or something like that, but you will no longer be able to activate certain effects. During my activation, I can choose between three different actions. I can basically travel, I can fight, or I can use a special ability of a card. And this can be one of my character cards or an acquired card such as an enemy, an item or a new friend I met. Most important thing to remember, I always have to activate a card with the exception of equipment cards which I just can put back at the end of a row without activating it. But this would then be my whole action this turn. Let's have a look at the first map and the number in each space shows how many movement points I have to create in order to enter them. So, in order to move Chala to this space, I would have to spend one movement point. And when I would like to move her down there, I would have to spend one, four and five movement points in total. Next to some of the spaces, you often see some additional symbols, but they only trigger when you end your movement on one of those spaces. So, if I just run past this green willpower point, I'm not allowed to get it. If I want it, I have to stop there and, yeah, basically call it a rest. Those red spaces tell you to stop there, so you're not allowed to just travel over them. And very often some bad things are happening there, like losing a willpower point for example. If I want to get this nice Hadrian Hourglass, and yes, you definitely want it, you have to stop on that space and then you put the appropriate card at the back of your rope. Willpower points are always great, so I guess I want Chada to move one space ahead. But as a refresher, I could now decide to travel, so those values wouldn't matter. I could fight, so I would refer to the strength of any given card in one of my rows. Okay, right now there is no enemy in one of my front rows, so I would not be allowed to do that. And I could use one of the special abilities on one of my cards. This one says, advance your figure one space, ignoring any movement points printed on it, or take one willpower point. In this case, I would have to flip the card to its rainy side, which is usually weaker and sometimes kind of different in respect to the option it provides. Right now, I only need one movement point, so I guess I will just generate two movement points from here. If I needed three, I would have to lose a willpower point. And for five points, I would even have to take one of those four cards. As I don't need more than two, I will activate this card for its travel value and once activated I will move it to the back of the very same stack. And so I have two movement points available and as long as I'm traveling at least one space ahead I can ignore any remaining points if I want. Okie dokie, let's move one space ahead, there I will end my movement, so let's check the symbol next to my space, and oh wonderful day, I just got another willpower point, and this also ends Chada's turn, so let's head over to Thorn, who can also travel, fight or use an ability, but of course there is also no enemy in one of his front rows, but if both heroes are on adjacent spaces, and this is currently the case, Thorn could also fight an enemy from Chada's front row, or vice versa, of course. They could also decide to fight together in this case, but then they would have both to activate a card. So imagine an enemy with a strength of 7. This 5 card would not be enough to defeat him, so Chada could decide to activate the 2 card, and Thorn could agree to activate his 5 strength card. But again, currently there are no enemies in sight, so I guess I want Thorn to generate three movement points, and so I guess I will activate this card here. Not a very smart move, but I want to show the outcome of this action. So I basically would have to flip this card to its rainy side, and I would also have to take a fog card from the current deck. Then let's do that, and first flip the card to reveal its clearly weaker side. Next, we move the flipped card to the back of the same row. And last but not least, I have to draw a 4 card, which leaves the deck with just 2 cards. And remember, if I ever have to draw a card and there is none left, I lose the game. 
And here I already found myself a pretty nasty enemy, Togger, Druid of the Tears, with a strength of 10, which is definitely quite a lot. But if I defeat this fella, I would gain 3 willpower points in return. Not a bad thing. Alternatively, I could decide to remove this card from the game by activating its special ability, which says that all players have to flip their character cards to the other side, which can be actually beneficial if most of the character cards are already on their rainy side, for example. But keep in mind, you only get the three willpower points if you defeat an enemy with your strength. But first of all, I have to put this enemy at the back of the row from where I started this action. This is really important as I have triggered this fog card from the left hand row. I also have to add any new cards to the very same row. And finally I can leverage the three movement points I gained to advance on the map. Whew. The good thing Chada is blocking this space and blocking can be a good thing in this game because I'm allowed to ignore any movement points that are printed on the blocked spaces. Normally I would have to spend 4 movement points, so basically 1 plus 3. But because Chada is blocking this space, I can move down to the other space with only 3 movement points. So let's have Thorna move to the next space. And of course the same is now true for Chada as well. Which means she doesn't need to spend 3 movement points to move over the space, but only just 1. And because it's a stop space anyway, she could reach it with a pretty small movement. If someone blocks the stop space, it is really entirely blocked. So the next hero can just move over it as well. And yeah, this was already the turn of Thorn. So we come back to Chada and I think she will also move one space ahead onto the stop space and therefore she just needs one movement point, which means she will activate this character card. Okay, let's put it back to the current row. Then let's have a look at the map. There's nothing printed on the path, but here we remember the stop space where I have to lose one wheel power and this I have to pay right away before I'm allowed to move on to the space. And again, I can ignore the space where Thorn is currently located and now Chada blocks the stop space for Thorn, which is definitely a great example of teamwork. And now it's back to Thorn and just to show you, he will decide to activate one of his curse cards. And right now this curse card is blocking his entire left row until it gets activated, of course. If your German would allow it, you would be able to read what you have to do with a curse card. So you place it in your pile with the resting side up, check. When this card then moves to the front row and you activate it the first time, you just flip it before its negative effects will be revealed. And here we are facing one of the worst curse cards in play, but at least it allows us to choose between one of the two bad options it offers. So for once I could take a fog card and move the curse figure one space ahead or I can decide to move the curse figure two spaces ahead. Awesome choices, right? For now everything is fine though as we just flip the curse card to its active side. So the only thing I have to do now is to move it to the back of the same stack. Quick turn for Thorn, let's activate Charter and just to demonstrate some different aspects, she will choose to use her special ability on her right flank or her left stack basically. And this says that she can either take an arrow card or grab Maro's amulet, but let's think pragmatic and go for the arrows, which can provide her sweet 9 strength points when fighting an enemy. Before I'm allowed to claim the arrows, I have to move the activating card to the back of the stack and only then I can add the weapon card to the back of the very same stack it was activated from. Next, Thorn will activate this card to travel and if he chooses the first option, he can flip the card back to its sunny side. So let's quickly do that and so we generate also one movement point. The card will be moved all the way to the back and now we see an enemy approaching, but fear not, we have to activate or attack him actively before he means any harm. With a single movement point, he will advance one space. And remember, the red space is still blocked by Chada. And because he ends his movement here, he will be allowed to grab the Hadrian Hourglass. And some of you might know it from the first big box expansion of Endor. And the cool thing about this Hourglass is that it allows to activate a curse card in a front row. And this might really come in handy at a later point in time. Chada wants to free up the card in the back. So I guess therefore she needs to activate the resting curse. So yeah, let's flip it. And yeah, 
Here we see one of the more standard curse cards, which allows you to lose a willpower point, to take a four card, or to advance the curse figure. But of course, for now, I only have to move the curse card to the last position of the current stack. And so the game progresses by having the two heroes slowly advancing from space to space and in most cases you really want to keep them nearby in order to fight together or donate willpower points and so on. And as soon as the first hero reaches this last red space on a map card he has to stop which allows us to flip the next map card and this also reveals stage 2 of our current legend the Spike Cliffs. Here I can decide to take the northern or the southern path. If I would decide to take the northern path you can see that I would have to move the curse figure two spaces ahead which would also mean I would immediately lose the game so not really a bright idea. But luckily there are items in the game such as the storm buckler which allows you to cross those symbols without having to move the curse figure. But without the storm buckler I would rather take the southern route until I might reach the same red stop space on this new map card. And so we would be allowed to have a peek at the third map card and with this first legend those are the only two middle cards. But as you shuffle those it could well be that the third would be at the second position of course. On this space you can meet a stranger who might follow you into your deck but I will try not to spoil too many things here. But you also see that there are travel points with higher values on them. So you definitely would have to activate some stronger effects on your cards. Or maybe the special ability of Merrick the Cartographer for example. And as mentioned I either make it to the destination spaces of my heroes. Or I lose the game because of the various losing conditions in this game. But what's really important in Charter and Thorn at least when you play it with two players. Is to discuss your strategies with your partner because it's really vital to time your cards accordingly. So something like, hey, I need your arrows to defeat this druid, or can your hourglass please flip my curse, so come adjacent to me that I can free up my character card, and so on. I really only scratched the surface of Jada and Torn, as there is a whole pile of additional four cards, some more strangers you might meet on your adventures, and of course additional icons and rules during later legends that will make the game a lot tougher. Then I hope you enjoyed my little walkthrough of Jada and Thorn here, and I hope to see you soon in one of my next videos, and yeah, until then, bye bye. <laughs>